John Conroe, welcome to Behind the Fiction. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I'm excited to have a special guest host here this week. Uh, oh, come on. Andrew. I am fanboying. I am totally <laughs> fanboying. Yeah, I, that's, uh, why, I, I that's used... why you're here today. <laughs> <laughs> I used Behind the Fiction as the reason of the, for the first time ever to reach out to John and say, you know what, with the pandemic and everything going on, he's probably at home. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely at home most of the time now, so that's great. Where are you physically, John, in the world? Uh, in Maine, uh, near uh, okay. Portland. Okay. All so right. about a mile from the ocean right now. Very Ooh. nice. And is it spring or still winter up there? No, it's, uh, it's very much spring. We've had an early spring this year. Uh, last year, it seemed to take right through May before we got uh, much, much in the way of decent weather. And this year we were uh, into 50s. Um, sometimes we hit 60 in March. So that's really quite out of the ordinary. Well, that's good. Early springs are always good. So Michael and I were chatting on a podcast a week or so ago, and I asked him the question, uh, where did the idea for his author notes come from? And he talked for a minute and he said, you know, I read this book by John Conroe. And I just really loved his author notes. Michael, you want to pick up the story there? Yeah. So what had happened was I, um, I was studying a little bit more about you, John, like six years ago. And you had given the little uh, description of why you wrote the Demon Accords. And if you would give the actual, because I'm pretty sure I've bastardized it for the last six or seven years and have told hundreds or if not thousands of people the wrong story, but it's very close. So if you'd give the original from your mouth story of how you came to write the Demon Accords, it would be fantastic. Th that's assuming I can remember it, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Twilight, let's set the stage. <laughs> yeah, uh, my daughters were in high school and uh, we've always been a very strong reading family. Um, we encouraged our girls to read everything and anything they could get their hands on. And my oldest daughter knew that I was into science fiction and urban fantasy. And she said, Dad, you got to read this book called Twilight. So I, you know, I'd like to encourage her. And I went ahead and I read it and I got them. And I was like, no, vampires don't sparkle. And um, I, I also have a problem with, with main characters who, whether they're male or female, I don't like characters who are weak. Uh, I, I prefer a strong character. I like strong women. Uh, all the women in my life are strong. And uh, so I, I didn't really like the main character of that series and I wanted to do something different. So uh, that's where the genesis of the idea started. And if you really want to know, I was watching a TV show that was on called Dollhouse. I don't know if you remember that. It was I know a, the name, but that's it. Yeah, it was a sci-fi show um, about a series of agents who would donate, you know, maybe they, they had a, a problem with a criminal past and they would volunteer for this program. And for two years, they would have their mind wiped and um, they would be um, reprogrammed with different skill sets. And then they would be sent out on different missions for paying customers. And I was watching that show and the main character was a very strong female. And I, I came up with the idea, why doesn't the, the powerful vampire be a female and uh, the male be something different? And um, so I went from there. And this was how long ago when you, when you started down this writing path? I wrote God Touched in 2008. So it was sometime in the early part of that year that I, I first came up with. I think it was actually probably in January I was watching TV and I, I had sort of the genesis in my mind. Um, these, so these things just sort of spring out in my, my imagination and then I have to kind of go with them. Did you expect when you started writing that 12 years later you, you would be a full-time writer? No, um, I had written one book previous to God Touch that has never seen the light of day. And actually, I finally rewrote it a few years later, and it became Black Frost, which is sort of a standalone novel, although I have brought those characters into my Demon Accords universe. Uh, but I, I got through it, and I said, wow, I wrote a whole book. It's garbage, but I wrote it. And uh, <laughs> I, I kind of felt like that was, that was a good beginning. Uh, so when I wrote the, the first God Touched, I thought, you know, this is okay. Um, let's see if I can get this published. And I couldn't get through uh, even the front door of any of the agencies out there. I, I was rejected 30 times uh, by various uh, literary agents. And so I, I kind of took the hint. Now, 
when I, when I was doing that, it was 2009, the fall of 2009, the great recession was in full mm -hmm. swing and it probably was not the best time to go out and seek an audience with uh, the different publishing houses. But uh, nonetheless, I got done uh, being rejected and decided that maybe I should just, you know, try it on my own and shelve the ideas of being a, um, a full-time author someday and, and really making a, a sort of a, a strong sales. And uh, I tried first Lulu, which is a print on demand service. And then I also decided to try this new thing called uh, Kindle Direct on Amazon. And uh, for the first year, it sort of, you know, puttered along and I kept writing books and I got, I think, two or three out. And then in the uh, fall or about August of 2012, uh, the books took off. There were a couple strong reviews of them by some, um, I guess, uh, uh, well followed reviewers. And uh, they just started to sell. So now, did uh, they take off because you had released uh, a, the next book in the series, or just a couple of reviewers saw it and liked it, and that was enough to to start to generate enthusiasm for the series? I firmly believe it was the reviewers. Uh, one of the guys titled his review "Badass Books for Guys," and I had always um, sort of geared my books to have um, a lot of action. Uh, reduce the amount of romance. So there should be some romance, but I wanted to, you know, keep that uh, out of the the main thrust of things. And uh, so they really do tend to be geared a little bit toward men, although I, I do have quite a few female fans. But when he wrote that title, that these are, are books that guys can get behind and that you, um, and, and in his review, he mentioned uh, the fact that they were very much action oriented and that the, um, uh, the martial arts and the gun uh, action was very uh, accurate and um, without any kind of uh, mistakes in it. Uh, that I think kicked off a big uh, following among male readers right off the bat. And where, and where were you working? Let me jump in. I'm just curious. Can you set the stage? Where were you working at the time? 2008 so for, to 2012? Well, for 32 years, I, I've been a, a banker uh, and finished my career as a certified financial planner. Uh, in 2008, I was in the trust department of my final employer, and um, that was, of course, when the, the markets all crashed, the Great Recession started. Uh, I was working with uh, a lot of clients and helping them steer through the, the debris of a stock market that had uh, never fallen that much in most people's lifetimes. And the horror of Wall Street was less than the horror of dealing with vampires and werewolves, so it kind of made a nice escape to uh, to step into a world of uh, secret organizations and and um, monsters from mythology. I've got to ask. So you you mentioned you know some time ago the last the last great recession. Um, <laughs> how would you compare that to to what's happening now? And are you really glad you're you're not still working in the trust department? Uh, so one actually one of my uh, my fellow workers reached out to me the other day and he said, "Aren't you glad you're not here?" <laughs> And um, it's to me, this is is a, a more of a shock. You know, nobody could tell when a pandemic would start. I think we've had some some people tell us for years that one could be coming, mm -hmm. but you don't know when it's going to start. And uh, so I think it's quite a bit different than the recession, which had a lot of real structural problems to our economy. This one, I think, if we can get on the other side of the disease, will probably, you know, pop back out fairly quickly. So I, I think it's a little different. Uh, but yes, yeah, Stephen, I'm I'm happy to be just handling my own money and, and not working with uh, with a client's money because that that's a tough field. So let's let's talk for a minute about um, Demon Accords. As you've got 15 books in that series now. Yeah, I have 15 books. Uh, I have I'm working on number 16. I have two uh, short story compendiums, um, which each have I think four stories in them, and I also have, uh, as I said, Black Frost, which is related to uh, that because I brought those characters into the universe. And Michael, I, I know Michael's a big fan of your work. Um, do, do you have any like specific questions about the series that you want to ask or, or should we just have John sort of tell listeners, give us, <laughs> give us the story behind the story for Demon Accords. Once you get beyond the vampires don't have sparkles. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, so for one of the reasons that, you know, back in 2011, 12, 13, 14, you know, I didn't really start writing until 2015. And well, 14 and then took some time off in between 2014, where I, when I had written like the first 30,000 words, and then I decided, you know what, I need to go back and study the books that I like. 
and I need to find the emotional resonance. And Demon Accords was one of those series that I took back and I go, let me reread this. And everywhere that I'm having a good time, let me understand why am I having a good time? And part of it, frankly, is that Demon Accords, you didn't start off and have to suffer through, this is my words because a lot of people like this, but I've already read a thousand plus books. I don't need people to start telling me, okay, I, I spend 500 words teaching them how to pull the trigger. You know, our main characters are already capable. They're already doing something. And so I didn't have to suffer that whole beginning stage. And I loved that about these books. Now, the aspects that he didn't know anything about, you know, that Chris Gordon, the, the main protagonist, didn't understand, well, that was something new. But as a reader, I enjoyed being able to learn those pieces with him where he was already capable. And now we're, we're trying to get into, you know, the first scene at, at the, the club when he's trying to figure out who's going on and these vampires are, have, are snarky. You know, they're, they're doing something, but it's kind of like a smirk on their face when they're doing it. And he's trying to understand what's going on. And he's actually dealing with demons. And now he's got to deal with vampires, <laughs> you know. And so it, it was just really an engaging aspect. And part of that main aspect is the first part. I'm like, you know what? I don't have to start from the beginning. I can start where they're already capable. Now, maybe they're not as capable as what they'll grow into, but they're already capable. And that was something that I took out when I was reading the stories. So. And John, was that something that was intentional from your part? Is that something that you wanted to be able to deliver to readers? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Again, uh, just coming back from reading Twilight, um, I wanted people that were capable, I and mean, that's a great term. That's a word that I use a lot. I, I, uh, one of my early influences in reading was Robert Heinlein, and uh, he has some great quotes out there. And, and there's um, uh, one that I can't remember. I used to have it pinned to my bulletin board, but it, it talks about you know uh, the fact that specialization is for insects, and that most people should be capable of a wide variety of things, anywhere from cutting firewood to planting a garden to uh, driving a boat, um, maybe even have some some medical first aid knowledge and and ability to handle mathematics. And I've always thought that, that that's a great idea to have well-rounded people who can do a lot of different things. And maybe they're not an expert at all those things, but they're they're capable of of surviving uh, problems and um, and some chaos that might rear up in everyday life. I know that when Michael started his series, uh, he had an idea for a certain number of books. And I, I'm curious about you. When you started, did you sense in this series that this was going to be a long series or you were just kind of, you, you would play it where it laid, so to speak? Uh, I'd, I'd fall on the second part of what you said, the, the play it where it laid. Um, I, I, I started reading a few nonfiction books when I started to write. And one of the, the most influential was Stephen King's on writing. And Stephen talks uh, about uh, the process of coming through his plot line as an archeological dig. And I found that to be exactly what I do. I don't always know uh, everything that's gonna happen in a story. Uh, Michael, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the vampires was very snarky and that's the waitress at the beginning of the, mm -hmm. of the series named Lydia. And yeah, I, had I couldn't no, remember her name and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And, and I had no idea she was an important character, but Lydia had a lot to say and she, uh, she is very snarky and she was not going to go away anytime soon. So I didn't know that when I started and uh, I don't know where my series are always going. Um, and certainly the Demon Accords now at 16, almost 16 books. I'm more than halfway through Dark and Queen, which is told from uh, Tatiana or Tanya's point of view. Uh, I, I have more to do in that universe, and I've sort of built myself a big playground to write in, and periodically I'll do a, a, a book from somebody else's point of view or a set of stories from different points of view to sort of flesh out the rest of the universe, and, and that's fun. I enjoy doing that. I imagine you do, too, to, to get different angles on things. Uh, to do the same thing over and over is not exciting, but to be able to, <laughs> to uh, sort of play in a big universe is fun. And uh, it, it makes my work sort of uh, not work at all. When did you last, I had to jump in here. Steve's like, I'm just going to say a couple of sentences or a couple of questions. And I'm sure, no, no, he hasn't. So I'm going to jump in with my second question. And, <laughs> and Steve's over there laughing. And ask you, when did you 
go full time. I believe you mentioned somewhere that your wife kind of encouraged you. And what was that like to take that step? I've only been full time writing for a year. Uh, I, again, I was trained as a certified financial planner and sort of that conservative, um, you know, cover all the bases thing uh, is highly important. And it coincided with my youngest daughter graduating college. So I needed to make sure I had those bills covered and having a steady paycheck from, from my bank job uh, and then the, the pay from my uh, book job um, was comforting. But I knew I wanted to go full time and I knew that I could do it. And uh, she agreed and said, let's, let's make a go of it. And uh, that's when we shifted over here to Portland area of Maine and uh, just took a big step. Oh, so you moved? Yeah, we were in Saratoga Springs, New York, and that's where we've lived for many years and uh, over 30 years. And then we uh, uh, came to Maine to uh, just kind of start the new writing life and, and try a new um, segment of uh, our life together and, and just see what, what this brought us. Isn't Maine where Stephen King is? Or he's yeah, up there somewhere. He's, uh, not that far away from me. He's up in Bangor, uh, which is probably an hour and a half, two hours away from Portland. Uh, so not quite stalking, just close. I'm not stalking him, but I, I actually, now that I live here, I can see where he's gotten a lot of his uh, uh, ideas from because Maine has some interesting things going on. The more you travel around in the state, you come across some kind of strange oddities, and I can see how that would generate great book ideas. So. Um, so yeah, I'm just sort of staying in his shadow and trying not to uh, get any restraining notices against me. <laughs> all right, Steve, you're loud again. Okay, all right, thank you. So what's, are, are you following the sort of the traditional work-life pattern where you get up and you start working at eight or nine and you finish at five or six the way you did through your career? Or are you, now that you're just a full-time author, have you come up with something new and completely different for yourself? Uh, I'd go with the new and different. So uh, I do start fairly early. Uh, so for years, I would wake up at 530, uh, get myself ready for work, and then I would write for whatever amount of time I could squeeze in before I had to leave for the office. And that ranged anywhere from a half hour to an hour, uh, and some days no time at all. Now that I can do what I want, I rise a little later, maybe eight o'clock, and I start writing um, after the first cup of coffee's gotten in me. And uh, I'll work till about 12 o'clock, sometimes one o'clock. And then I take the rest of the day and go do stuff with my wife. And how is she reacting to having you around so much more? Uh, well, it's a little bit of an adjustment. So it helps that I'm, I'm locked away in my cave for uh, the first part of the morning, but I think she's really enjoyed having me home. And, and uh, since we're in a new state and a new location, there's been a lot of exploration to do, and that's best done as a, as a couple, as opposed to trying to go out and do it on your own. And uh, so I think, I think she's enjoyed it. Um, I might have to ask her that later and see if she disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> so why, so I'm curious. So back in 2010, um, there wasn't much about Ken Unlimited, which had a very b bumpy start and went through multiple iterations. And you're still predominantly wide, right? Because you, yes. you send them to everywhere. Yep. And I was wondering about this a couple of years ago when I, I noticed that about you. I'm like, well, that's interesting. He's he's not in KU. What is your, What are your thoughts behind that? So if, As a financial uh, guy. Yeah, exactly. And the word diversification comes to mind. Uh, Amazon is my primary sales platform by far. Uh, Audible is a close second. That's also an Amazon company. Um, and then I have uh, uh, smash words for distribution to all the other characters out there like uh, Apple and Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. uh, Kobo, things like that. Um, I probably would maybe do a bit better if I went Kindle Unlimited, but I like the idea of having uh, my eggs separated in a couple different baskets in the event that um, you know I, I screw up and do something that that um, uh, gets me off of the Amazon platform, so I don't know what that is, and I'm being uh, you're careful a, not to. You're a certified financial planner. What partying are you going to do that's going to cause you to get kicked off? Well, I'm not a planner anymore, so who knows what partying I want to do? But again, it's that diversification thing. It's 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 having, uh, and that's how it started out. But now I have some. Uh, fans who will write me and say, I really like getting on a different platform 
And when I first launch a book, it usually comes out on Amazon and Audible very quickly. But uh, the other ones take maybe a day before I have them out. And people notice that and they're like, when can I get it on Smashwords? Or when can I get it on Barnes and Noble or Apple? Or And since mm-hmm. they like those platforms, I continue to support them. I don't want to uh, cut off anybody from something that they really like. Speaking yeah, I mean, of that diversific- is a- Go ahead. I was going to say, it's a very common refrain when I speak to other authors and ask them about their business side of things. Those that are wide, at least half of the time, it lets them sleep better at night. That is a completely common refrain. Okay, Steve. You mentioned diversification, and I I see that audio is a big part of your, I don't know what what part it plays in the sales mix, but in terms of the product mix, you have a lot of audio books out there. I'm, I'm guessing close to one for every book you've got. I, I Ab- think absolutely. I saw yep. That's correct. And I saw that you have a new book coming out, A Murder of Shadows, releasing in April? Uh, it'll release on May 5th. May 5th, and okay. It'll be simultaneous, simultaneously published on Amazon and Audible the same day. Uh, which is something I hadn't done before. I'd always put them out on Amazon. And then as soon as Amazon uh, Audible could get them up and running, then they would do it. But we're doing this one as a sim pub. Um, it's a new series for me. It's a fantasy series, or at least it's my take on fantasy and uh, the, the, the swords and sorcery kind of thing. But um, I'm hoping that uh, wherever Tolkien is, he's not looking down when I, when I bring this one to light because uh, <laughs> it's a little different. Kind of like uh-huh. Bram Stoker or Bram Stoker whenever you pulled out vampires. What is he doing with this? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the simultaneous release. Um, obviously, you need to withhold the release of the ebook. Yes. To, to give time for the audiobook to be produced. And that, that takes some time. Um, what goes through your mind when you're making the decision to do that? Uh, there's a there's a couple things. I have sort of a steady pace of book releases that I do, and my mm-hmm. my fans have gotten used to that. Uh, and so one of the things I had to do was to get them set up to understand that this one I was going to get it done, and that there'd be a little bit longer wait than normal. Uh, Audible has been fantastic. They you know they promised me they'd get this done as quick as as humanly possible, and probably less than three months. And uh, if they uh, can get it done on the 5th of May, and of course with COVID, who knows, but since they mostly are working from home, I think it's on track for that. Um, then that, that'll be great. We'll, we'll get onto that cycle. And from there on out, I won't have my, my audio readers having to wait as much for books if I can swing it. Can I, can I just clarify you- and say as, as a fan, it's begrudgingly have gotten accustomed to your release schedule. You've begrudgingly gotten used to it? Yes. In other words, I'd prefer it to be shortened. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, no, so I get like, a lot of comments to that, to that effect. They're like, what are you doing on Facebook? Get right Yes, in. yes. I'm like, as, as a fan, it's completely different than being an author or a publisher. I'm like, what the hell? I, I <laughs> want on, it John. now, yes. I'm, yeah. So what works for you in terms of a release schedule? What, what's your preferred release schedule? Uh, as soon as I get the book done, I get it fully edited. I get it back and, and complete all my edits on it. Um, I like to get it out within 24 hours of that moment and uh, and have it in <laughs> the fans' hands because people like Michael might come after me if I don't. So. They might. Well, now that I know what, country, what state you're in, <laughs> that's yes. a long way to go from Las Vegas. Out. I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> But from a uh, from a gap between releases, do you have something that you're shooting for, like every six months or every four months or something? Uh, so when I first started writing, I, I, the initial time between one book and the next was fairly long, and that has shortened as I've gotten. I'm hopeful that I'm getting a little better at this writing process. Um, Last year, I got four books out. I'm hoping to do the same thing this year. So roughly, I'm trying to do it every three months or so. It doesn't always work that way. Uh, In this case, I'll probably bring out A Murder of Shadows on uh, May 5th, if that hits, and Dark and Queen, which is number 16 for the Demon Accord series. I'm thinking might come out by the end of May. So I might have two books in one month. And, um, And Dark and Queen won't be done on... Uh, Audible as a sim pub, it'll come out a little later than that. But eventually, I'm going to get on a schedule where I think all of them are on that. So, so you, me, is is this the ahead. new timing as a full time writer, shooting for every three months? Yeah. Yep. That's um, and it's it's 
it's uh, hard to stick to that. I give myself guidelines. I give myself deadlines. Um, but life gets in the way sometimes. I have two adult daughters, and you know, if they need dad, then that comes before anything else. And that's a that's one of the great um, privileges of being a, a self-employed writer. And that is that if I need to go take care of family, I can do it, and I don't worry about consequences. And so sometimes that'll happen, and that might slow me down by a week or two. Um, sometimes uh, my writing ebbs and flows. Uh, right now, I'm writing Dark and Queen kind of fast and furious, but there are times when the muses are quieter, and um, I'm picking my way through where I want the thing to go, and my word count each day might be a little lower. So mm -hmm. it's just a process, and I've gotten used to it, and I think after a year now of being out on my own, um, you know, this three to four book a year thing, I think, is doable. Now, what are the size of your books? Because I remember back in the beginning, they're not small. They're not short books. I, I always want over 80,000, and I'd like to be closer to 90,000. Some of my books have been 95,000. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I've had a 100,000 word book. Um, Still, I, I just, that's a pretty good size for an ur what's effectively an urban fantasy paranormal. Yeah, yeah, that's what I shoot for. I grew up doing an awful lot of reading as a kid. I've written or uh, read thousands of books. And um, all the books I was reading were, were mostly sci-fi and the paperbacks, and they fit into that 80,000 uh, word to 90,000 pretty handily. And, and uh, sometimes they were less than that in those days, but, um, but I, that's, a, that's a number I shoot for.